to a United Methodist virtual service. We're glad you could join us. Won't you come in? United Methodist Church. Please wave your palms and join me in singing Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Thank you. 
welcome to worship. I'm Tiffany Detain, the pastor of Manitou United Methodist Church. And on behalf of our community, I'd like to thank you for joining us in worship today. I have a few announcements for you this morning. Our virtual district youth group will be meeting this afternoon, Sunday, March 28th at 2 p.m. on Zoom. So if you have a student in 6th through 12th grade who'd like to get involved, please send me an email. Our Monday Thursday service will be taking place this coming Thursday on our YouTube channel at 7 p.m. And our Good Friday service will take place on Friday at 7 p.m. on our YouTube channel. And I hope that you will all join us for these special services. You can still drop off your donations for Shalom Ministry or Family Promise on Wednesday afternoons between 1.30 and 2 p.m. in the church parking lot on 33rd Avenue across the street from the church building. Our team of volunteers will be there ready to receive your donations and transport them to our ministry partners. As always, your donations are greatly appreciated. Will you please join me in our call to worship? The story of faith is a story of courage. It took courage for John the Baptist to prepare the way. It took courage for Mary to say, here I am, use me it took courage for the disciples to drop their nets and follow Jesus. It took courage for the paralyzed man's friends to lower him through the roof. It took courage for Peter to walk on water. It took courage for Zacchaeus to give up half of his possessions to the poor. It took courage for Jesus to enter Jerusalem on a donkey. Faith has never been easy. It is a journey of courage. Again and again, God show us the way. Let us worship a brave and courageous God. Please join me in prayer. God of palm branches and hallelujahs, we confess we love a good Palm Sunday celebration. We love the sound of a joyful parade. We love shouting hallelujah. We love that Palm Sunday means Easter is just around the corner. We love good news. However, if we slow down and pay attention, we know that Palm Sunday was not a walk in the park for you. There was risk. There was fear. There was the threat of violence. Forgive us for glossing over the courage this day took. Remind us that the story of faith is a story of courage. And even we can do hard things. With hope we pray. Amen.
Let's remember to keep our Manitou friends, family, and loved ones in our prayers this week. We have prayers for God's comfort for Ted Swanson and his family as they mourn the passing of his niece, Carolyn Maydew. We have prayers for healing, recovery, and peace for Cole Hayden, Shelley Puny, Jody and David Weaver, Phyllis Everest, Gail Glass, Jordan Moon, Mary Alice Everly, Howard Strick Jr., Darlene Townsend, Stacy Nash, Walter Sauer, Jim McCurdy, Wes and Peggy Ackerman, Judy O'Brien, Mark Rundquist, and Evelyn Torkelson. Will you join me in prayer? God, we gather together to pray for our church community and to give you thanks for the ways that we are able to connect in this season of disconnection. We rejoice with those who are celebrating births, new jobs, weddings, anniversaries, recovery from illness or surgery, a positive diagnosis, and restored relationships. We lift them up to you with hearts full of praise and thanksgiving. God, as we journey towards the cross over this next week, we are more mindful of death than ever. God, we weep with those whose hearts are full of sorrow. For the ones who have experienced a loss of home or job, the loss of a relationship, memory, or loss of a loved one. Today, we specifically lift up the ones who have passed away in Atlanta, Georgia, and Boulder, Colorado. We ask that you would hold their family and loved ones' heads above the waters of grief, and that you would provide them with comfort and hope in a time where that seems impossible. God, we pray for those who are facing challenges that seem overwhelming, for the ones who are waiting for results, coping with difficult diagnoses, and living with chronic illnesses. God, we pray for those who are facing difficult decisions and uncertain futures. We lift them up to you in prayer and pray that they will sense your nearness in these difficult circumstances and times. Be with us this day. Guide us. Give us courage and hope. Will you please join me in singing the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray?
1 through 19. It begins with Mary anointing Jesus. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume, made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and he kept the common purse and used to steal for that which was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The plot to kill Lazarus. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone with him. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks. Thank you, John. There are so many characters or groups in this story that you or I can try to identify ourselves with, isn't there? Are you Lazarus, raised from the dead? Mary, the extravagant gift giver? Judas, the complainer and thief? Or perhaps you identify with the religious leaders who thought that the religious world was getting a bit out of control. Or maybe you identify with Jesus, who knew his life was about to change forever. Perhaps you see yourself in the crowd, one of the many individuals welcoming Jesus into the city and into the nitty-gritty needs of your life. I would guess that at one time or another, you and I could see ourselves in each of the characters or groups in this text. But on Palm Sunday, you and I so want to see ourselves in the crowds who welcome Jesus, don't we? We want to see ourselves as the one who waved their palm branches in a wild welcome of the king. We want to be a part of the crowd who ushers 
in the Savior, to be part of the group who identifies Jesus as the person who will set us free. And on some level, that longing, it's true for each of us. But when you and I read the Bible, we often only want to see ourselves in the ones who welcome Jesus, in the ones who were healed, in the ones who served others. But if we dig down, we know that isn't always true, right? I wonder sometimes if I would have had the courage to follow Jesus. Because as a minister and a religious nerd, I'm probably more predisposed to behave like one of the Pharisees or religious leaders than the crowd in our text today. Because it takes a lot of courage to follow Jesus. It took a lot of courage then, and it takes a lot of courage now. Because Jesus doesn't play by our rules or stay within the perimeters that we set out for him. And God's spirit, it won't be contained. And it's funny, really, we often find it shocking that the God of the universe could be more creative and imaginative than we are. That God and God's spirit can see more possibilities or ways to do things than you or I could imagine. And so we must draw on courage to follow Jesus. Because when we do, we will often have to step out into the unknown give up our power, our position, our way of doing things, to follow the leading of the Spirit. The Pharisees and other religious leaders could have drawn on their courage and been a part of what God was up to through the mission and ministry of Jesus. Those religious leaders could have been a part of that palm-waving crowd, but they decided to dig their heels in instead. And not only that, they actively worked against the mission and ministry of Jesus. They actively worked against what God was up to in the world. And they did it for so many reasons. The religious leaders had a lot of power, and they knew that that power and position, it was partially tied to the peace of the Roman Empire. So they weren't about to rock the boat because that would mean the end of their power and positions that they currently enjoyed. And if the empire cracked down on Jesus and his ministry, it might have meant the end of life and worship as all of the people currently knew it. It was a big risk. And so these religious leaders decided that the trade-off for following Jesus, it wasn't worth it. That their best course of action was to steady the ship, to keep things the way that they were. So no matter what miracles Jesus performed, no matter how many times he stumped their best attempts to expose him as a fraud or a sham, these leaders still never came to the conclusion that perhaps they were wrong. And Jesus was the one that they had been waiting for, that Jesus had been sent by God. By the end of Jesus' ministry, things got really ridiculous. The religious leaders were plotting to kill Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the 
the dead? Because so many people were believing in Jesus on account of it. I mean, think about it. These religious leaders couldn't even be happy for someone who was raised from the dead. And once these leaders saw the palm-waving, wild welcome of Jesus by the crowds, oh, it pushed them over the edge. They went from plotting the death of Lazarus to plotting the death of Jesus. And then we have Mary, who chose to draw on courage in a whole another way. From the other Gospels, we know that Mary didn't always embrace the normal role for women at that time. She sidestepped some of those cultural norms in order to be a devoted follower of Jesus. Mary had even sat at the feet of Jesus while he was teaching, which was the place of a disciple. And in our text today, we find Mary taking on the role that was usually reserved for the lowest servant in the house, but with a bit of a lavish twist. Mary washed Jesus' feet with an expensive perfume, and then she wiped off his feet with her hair. Mary used a pound, six ounces of expensive perfume to wash Jesus's feet. And when I say expensive, I mean expensive. This perfume was worth almost a year's wages. And so, of course, Judas complains that she could have spent her money caring for the poor instead. Which is funny, coming from the man who was about to betray his rabbi for a price. But Jesus says Mary made the right choice. Mary drew on courage to take on the lowest servant role, and then to lavish Jesus with hospitality and love. The whole house must have been saturated in the scent of her extravagant love and devotion to Jesus. And this foot washing scene will feel a bit familiar next week because on Monday, Thursday, we'll see Jesus wash the feet of his own disciples as an expression of love and service followed by a command for them to do the same. And then there's the crowds. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was not a risk-free palm party. The crowds had to draw on courage to show up. They were celebrating and welcoming Jesus into the city as their savior. As a liberator from Roman oppression, the crowds were hailing Jesus as the new king. Palm branches were symbols of national triumph and victory. Their shouts of Hosanna, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord, king of Israel. That could put the entire city of Jerusalem in a whole heap of trouble. This palm party could have been construed as the beginning of an insurrection. And there would have been consequences if the Romans found out. But the crowds, the crowds believed Jesus was the one that they had been waiting for. He was the one who would restore God's kingdom in their nation. The crowds believed that Jesus was the one who would set them free from Roman oppression. 
They believed Jesus was the one who would open the doors to a new life for them. And so this crowd, it was willing to take the risk. Church, let's face it, it may depend on the day where we see ourselves in this story or text, or who we might identify with most closely in this story. But it's my hope that you and I as individuals, as a church community, as our own Manitou United Methodist crowd, will seek to draw on our own courage and be more like the crowds who welcomed Jesus into the city and less like the religious leaders who plotted to kill him. I think it's important for us to be intentional about the kind of crowd that we want to be, intentional about the kind of people we want to be. Will we be a people who seek to hold on to our power and our privilege to what is familiar and known and safe? Or will we joyfully welcome in God and all the unexpected ways the Spirit is at work in the midst of us and in our world? Will we be a bit ridiculous like Mary? Will we love others lavishly, wasting our time and our precious money on loving and serving others well? Or will we only worry about ourselves and try to cheat the system like Judas? Will our community, our crowd, find strength in numbers? And will those numbers give us the courage to welcome God into our midst, into our churches, into our city in a whole new way? Or will we hedge our bets on what is known, normal? When something changes in our community, what's your first thought? What's your first feeling? Is it fear or excitement? Courage or displeasure? Do you immediately think, oh my gosh, we need to go back to the way it was before? Or... Can you leave space for even just a little bit of imagination that God might do something new and different in our community? That God might do something new and different in our midst? Friends, we have been in the unknown. We are still and the unknown, and we are headed into the unknown and slow process of eventually reopening. And yet we know that things won't ever be exactly the same as they were before. Some things will be different because of restrictions, and other things will be different because of the way we have been changed by this pandemic experience. And that means our community is on the path to becoming something new and different. So I hope that you and I can keep our eyes peeled for the way that God is at work among us, that we'll keep asking ourselves what God is calling us to in the future. Church, Manitou United Methodist crowd, let's make a conscious effort to hang up our religious leader long time attender coats at the door, or better yet, let's lay them and create a pathway that welcomes Jesus and the Spirit of God into our midst. And let us draw on courage instead of fear. 
May we always be a community who makes room and welcomes the work of God among us even if it's not what we had expected. Amen. together and amazed by all that God has accomplished in these difficult circumstances and times. Please make sure you take a moment this week to mail in your tithes and your offerings, or you can give online through our church website. Pray with me. Almighty and everlasting God, we bring our gifts and lay them at your altar. We remember the crowds in Jerusalem who laid their cloaks on the road shouting, Hosanna, as Jesus passed. We know they were looking for a Messiah who is different from who you sent Jesus to be. Not one of political power or military might, but one who came in compassion and mercy to heal, love, and save. Search our hearts that we might be confident that the Messiah for whom we long for is the one we know, you know we need. Jesus Christ, your anointed one, in whose name we pray. Amen.
I leave you with this benediction today. As you leave our time together, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. And may your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk towards justice. And may your heart know its worth. And may your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself. Go with courage, go with heart, and go in peace. Amen. Oh, bro.